This episode contains descriptions of domestic violence that some listeners may find triggering. Please be advised. It's September 1984 in New York City, and the annual Gucci America board meeting is about to begin. The boardroom is as fancy as you'd expect. We're on the 13th floor of a glass skyscraper on Fifth Avenue. There's a mahogany table and leather chairs. The room smells like what you want cologne to smell like, but never does. So like notes of leather and spice instead of menthol and Windex. (laughs) Exactly. This is the place where rich people get richer, and all you basically need to do is show up. Actually, no, not even that. You just need to send someone to show up for you. Gucci is still a family-owned business, but none of the Gucci's themselves are even here. They've all sent representatives. Maurizio Gucci has sent his lawyer, Domenico De Sol. Maurizio's cousins slash rivals have sent their own people. And his uncle Aldo has sent Gucci's chief operating officer, Robert Barry, to lead the meeting. Even though Aldo's just taking calls in his office on the 12th floor, a.k.a. one floor below. I mean, as someone who texts a person who's sitting right next to me, that doesn't seem that ridiculous. Yeah, that reminds me, I got a reply. <laughs> <laughs> These meetings are always the same. Right now, the CEO, Robert Barry, is looking over the agenda. It's short this year. That's a relief. He skipped breakfast and his stomach's grumbling. Just as he's about to start, Maurizio's lawyer, De Sol, stands up. Hello, everyone. I'd like to begin with a vote to add one more item to the agenda. Barry groans. De Sol continues. But I'll keep it quick. We'll all be out of here by lunchtime. Promise. Okay, Barry perks back up. That's more like it. Dasol clears his throat. I'm requesting a motion to dissolve the board. Barry almost falls over. He couldn't have heard that right. Dasol is basically saying he wants them to fire Aldo and put someone else in charge. Wait, can they even do that? I mean, technically, yeah, but no one's ever tried this before. When Aldo brought his sons into the fold, he gave them 10% of the company, but it all came from his half. So Aldo's share went down to 40%, while Rodolfo stayed at 50. If just one of his sons ever teamed up with Rodolfo, Aldo could be fired, but none of his sons would ever dare do that. Dasol sits back down and asks, who seconds the motion? He looks down the table. Three representatives, one for each of Aldo's sons, look back at him. Giorgio's rep says nothing. Roberto's rep says nothing. And then Paolo's rep raises his hand. I second the motion. Barry doesn't stick around to hear the rest. He runs to the nearest stairwell and races down from the 13th floor to get Aldo. But before he even clears the floor, Aldo has been deposed. The new king of Gucci has been announced. And it's not one of Aldo's sons. The mastermind behind this coup and Gucci's new chairman is Maurizio. From Wondery, I'm Brooke Ziffrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And this is Even the Rich. In our last episode, Maurizio Gucci and Patrizia Reggiano fell in love, and each was able to give the other exactly what they needed. For Patrizia, who was born out of wedlock and spent her childhood constantly being reminded of it, that was social standing. For Maurizio, who grew up under the watchful eye of a controlling and fearful father, that was confidence. Now, with Patrizia's support, Maurizio's finally ready to step onto the Gucci family ladder and see how high he can climb. But he's got competition. And just because his competition is family doesn't mean they're going to play nice. This is episode two, All in the Family. Okay, let's back up a little bit. We're in the spring of 1971, 12 years before Maurizio's attempted coup. He's only 23 years old, and he's just been hired to be his Uncle Aldo's right-hand man in New York City. This is his big chance to prove he has what it takes to be Aldo's next in line, but it's gonna be an uphill battle. Of the four Gucci boys who are in the running, 
Maurizio's the only one who's not Aldo's son. Hmm, so an underdog with not enough nepotism. How challenging for him. Yeah, times are tough. (laughs) So let me introduce you to the competition for the Gucci throne. There's Aldo's oldest son, Roberto, nicknamed The Priest. Unlike his father, he's very religious. He's married to an equally pious woman, and Aldo hates coming over to their house for dinner because all the portraits of the Virgin Mary make him feel like he's in a cemetery. But Roberto's stable and responsible. The question is, can he also be ambitious? Next up is Giorgio, the second son. Family friends describe him as very timid and completely crushed by the enormous personality of his father. When he was Maurizio's age, he went to New York to learn the ropes, but he burned out pretty quickly. He likes the slow life and taking long, quiet beach vacations with his mom. Okay, so he's not actually trying to compete for the throne. No, not really. But then there's the third son, Paolo. He's creative and fiery. For example, there's this unspoken rule in the family that men should always be clean-shaven. But Paolo, he grows a thick, burly mustache. Deep down, his father admires him for it. He compares his youngest son to a purebred horse who, unfortunately, would never allow himself to be ridden. Hmm, what a lovely way to talk about your child. (laughs) Truly. The point is, Paolo's free-spirited. And unlike his brothers, he truly loves fashion. He relocates to Gucci's design headquarters in Milan, where he starts working under his uncle Rodolfo. It's like a nephew exchange program. Paolo's with Rodolfo, and Maurizio is now with Aldo. And the older generation is watching the younger generation, seeing which horse will pull ahead. (laughs) And it's tight. Paolo has flair and confidence and ambition, which matters to Aldo. Maurizio isn't as creative or sure of himself. Not yet, at least. But there is one thing he's got going for him that Paolo doesn't. Patrizia. It's 1973 in New York City. Since they arrived in the Big Apple, Patrizia and Maurizio haven't stayed in one place for long. No apartment's been good enough for them, at least according to Patrizia. But today, she thinks she's found a place they can finally call home. It's a two-floor penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue. And all this space makes Patrizia so giddy, she won't stop skipping around the cafeteria-sized living room. Cafeteria-sized? Brooke, these people measure in yachts, not cafeterias. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Maurizio keeps shaking his head. This is crazy. They don't need a penthouse with a yacht-sized living room. Thank you. (laughs) He can't possibly ask his family to pay for this. Patrizia stops skipping. She's like, okay, you don't have to ask. I will. So she does. And guess what? They get the apartment. Patrizia has only recently become a Gucci wife, but she understands what it means to be a Gucci in a way Maurizio still doesn't. Running a luxury goods company isn't just about being good at business. It's also about projecting style and glamour. It's about being the face of the brand, which doesn't just happen because you have the same name as it. Patrizia decorates their new penthouse to the nines. She chooses taupe faux suede fabric for the walls. She buys tables made from smoked glass. And she drapes leopard and jaguar skins over everything, so her and I would not get along. (laughs) They hire a chauffeur to drive them around the city. And they put a vanity license plate on the car so everyone knows exactly who's in the backseat. It reads, Mauizia, which is a mashup of their names. Definitely not a great mashup of names. No, it's not, but she's a trailblazer. (laughs) Like, one could even say that Moitzia crawled so that Benefer could walk. One could say that, but should one say that? I'm going to keep saying it. (laughs) (laughs) And everything Patrizia is doing, it's working. They become a power couple. Maurizio's still shy, but Patrizia pushes him to get out and be seen. When he's too tired to go out, She rallies and goes out alone, so there's a Gucci at every major social gathering. The society pages start tracking her comings and goings, and the rest of the Guccis start paying attention too. Aldo's been impressed by her ever since she called him up and asked him to bring Maurizio into the fold. But now that he's seeing her in action, he's more than impressed. He's dazzled. Even Rodolfo, who, as you'll remember, once called her a gold digger, is coming around. Oh, I remember. (laughs) 
<laughs> it takes longer for Rodolfo than Aldo, but in 1976, Rodolfo finally gets there. Patrizia gives birth to his first grandchild, a girl, and she names her daughter after her father-in-law's favorite person in the entire universe, his late wife, Alessandra. Rodolfo's over the moon, and five years later, she makes him a grandfather again when she has her second daughter, Allegra. Rodolfo is ready to make up for lost time and spoil his son and his son's family rotten. He buys them a second penthouse in the same building on Fifth Avenue so they can combine the two penthouses into one giant one. He buys them a plot of land in Acapulco to build a house on. Also, a ski chalet in St. Moritz, a farm in Connecticut, and a duplex penthouse in Milan. Most parents spoil their kids by letting them eat a Snickers bar before dinner. <laughs> My God. Seriously. Patrizia couldn't be happier. She spent her childhood on the B team. Her mom was the mistress, not the wife. She didn't get her real father's last name until she was a teenager. But Patrizia's a proper Gucci now. She settled the family feud between father and son for good. She's shown him that they have exactly what it takes to carry on the Gucci brand. Now, as long as Maurizio keeps working hard for Aldo and learning everything he can, Patrizia and her husband might just be next in line for the throne. But wait, what happened to ride him hard Paolo? <laughs> So remember that nephew exchange program I mentioned? Mm -hmm. Well, Maurizio's been working under his uncle Aldo, Paolo's been working under his uncle Rodolfo, and it's not going great. I might have mentioned this before, but Rodolfo has some control issues. Yeah, I mean, this is the dad who had his own son tailed every time he <laughs> rode his bike around the block. Exactly. And now he's working with a nephew who's experimental and creative. Paolo keeps mocking up new bags and shoe ideas for Gucci, and Rodolfo just takes one look at them before he shouts, no, no, no. They fight every day, and the fights are heated. Purses regularly fly out the windows. Okay, well, I hope somebody turned that into a side hustle, just sitting outside mm. the Gucci office all day waiting for your <laughs> daily airmail delivery of purses. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's a dream. Eventually, Paolo decides that if his family brand isn't going to include his designs, he'll start a brand that will. He names it PG for Paolo Gucci. As you'd expect, his father and his uncle sue him six ways to Sunday. <laughs> okay, so is it safe to say Maurizio's got the edge in this cousin matchup? Yeah, I mean, Paolo's falling way behind. Sometimes it even looks like he's running backwards. Like, for example, when he threatens to turn in his own dad for not paying taxes. And also when he starts making Gucci counterfeits on the side. His family only finds out about that when they're trying to shut down his Paolo Gucci factories. When it comes to the cousins, this isn't even a contest anymore. The big question stops being who and starts being when. It's clear Maurizio is the next in line, but his dad and uncle are still ahead of him. Aldo's dedicated his entire life to Gucci. And while Rodolfo spent most of his life making new director cuts of his home movies, he absolutely hates giving up control. So it doesn't seem likely that either one of them will be stepping down anytime soon. Or at least that's what everyone thinks. But in 1982, Rodolfo learns something that's going to drastically change the timeline. It's November 22nd, 1982. Over 1,000 guests are pouring into the Cinema Manzoni in the heart of Milan. Tonight, Rodolfo is screening the newest cut of My Life in Film. Ooh, I thought you were joking about the director's cuts. <laughs> No, I was not, but this screening is a little bit different because it's also a welcome home party for Maurizio and Patrizia. They're back in Milan after 10 years abroad, and Rodolfo has tweaked the latest version of his film to pass along some life lessons. The film starts with narration from Rodolfo. The following is a pathetic love story, a story that I wish would never end. The story of a man who wants to tell his son about his family and help him see the world in the right perspective. Mm, this man is so extra. Images sweep across the screen of Maurizio's childhood, the very first Gucci workshop, scenes from Rodolfo's old silent movies, his granddaughter's baptisms. Rodolfo's narration runs over all of it. The real riches of this world, beyond the ones we can trade or manage, are life, youth, friendship, love. These are the riches we must treasure and shelter always. 
This is his message to Maurizio. Remember what's important. To most of the people in the audience, it's a sweet gesture from an eccentric man, like if Howard Hughes started writing film-length Hallmark cards. Your love surrounds me like these battles of urine. Ah, that's deep. Only Rodolfo and his close family know the real reason he's filled his film with life lessons. He has cancer, and the treatments aren't working. Whether or not Rodolfo's ready to step aside, he doesn't have a choice. He's getting weaker, and he's spending more and more time in doctor's offices and hospitals. It's time for Maurizio to take the reins. In Rodolfo's final days, he hands out some last words of advice. He tells Maurizio to never let his guard down around Paolo. His asshole cousin might still have some tricks up his sleeve. You must fight your cousin with everything you've got, Rodolfo tells him. He's a threat to everything we've built, and it will be up to you to protect us. And then he pulls aside Patrizia and tells her that he's still worried about Maurizio. Rodolfo tried to impart some lasting words of wisdom in his film, but it might not have been enough. Once he dies, Maurizio's going to inherit more power and money than he'll know what to do with. If he's weak, that power will destroy him. He tells Patrizia that she might wake up one day and find that she's married to a different man. But Patrizia just pats his hand, like, there, there, old man. She's not worried about Maurizio, because Maurizio has her. Every time they've hit a fork in the road, she steered them in the right direction. She knows they can do anything, survive anything, as long as they keep on doing it together. Most of us have hacks for when we need to de-stress or we're having trouble falling asleep. But sometimes you need a little extra help. And on those days when you're needing a positive push, our sponsor, Plus CBD, just might be your perfect go-to product. Plus CBD's pure ingredients can help reduce stress, alleviate soreness, and improve your overall sleep. Yes. So Plus CBD, a.k.a. my true love, is <laughs> San Diego's trusted CBD brand and the number one selling natural hemp extract in the U.S. Daily use of Plus CBD gummies get you the rest you need so you can wake up feeling focused and refreshed. They taste great and they're made with award-winning CBD combined with melatonin, magnolia bark, and lemon balm. They've also got Calm gummies, perfect for daily relaxation and to help support a sense of calm when you're feeling overwhelmed. Like, honestly, I don't know how much more I can gush about these gummies. Like, I truly <laughs> just love them so much. Yeah. Like, we were literally talking about them before know, we even started recording this ad. <laughs> they really it's do. Like, hey, yeah. let me update you on my love for gummies <laughs> again. Sleep better tonight at pluscbdoil.com. Enter promo code RICH for 40% off your order. That's pluscbdoil.com. Promo code RICH for 40% off your order. Mama, mama, la. On May 15, 1983, Rodolfo dies. As expected, everything goes to his adored only son. There's his St. Moritz estate, his $20 million in Swiss bank accounts, and, of course, 50% of the Gucci empire, which is valued at around $230 million. Rodolfo also leaves him one small but symbolic gift, his father Guccio's wallet. The message is clear. It's your turn to hold the purse strings. When people look at you, they won't be seeing Aldo's protege or Rodolfo's son. They'll be seeing the new co-chair of Gucci. Maurizio takes the message to heart. He's ready to be his own man and do things his own way. He's ready to think big and be the one who moves Gucci into the future. For the first time in Maurizio's life, he's in control of his own finances. The boy who begged his dad's driver for spare change can now walk straight into a Ferrari showroom and buy one right off the floor. I mean, same if we're talking about Matchbox. Exactly. Maurizio's finally free to get whatever he pleases, and he does. This taste of freedom sparks a strong desire for more. And there's one area of his life where he's really craving it. Work. Maurizio's been under Aldo's tutelage for years now which is more like a dictatorship. He can't make a move without his uncle's permission. Maurizio's sick of it. 
He wants a seat at the table and a say in all business matters, especially because he thinks Gucci's in desperate need of a makeover. Over the past decade, the brand's been losing its luster and prestige. Uncle Aldo's licensed out the Gucci name, allowing for canvas bags covered in the Double G logo to be mass-produced. These cheaper bags are saturating the market, and it's making Gucci a lot less status symbol and a lot more QVC. Other companies like Hermes and Louis Vuitton are becoming the must-have bags for the uber-rich. Maurizio wants to revive the company, take Gucci back to its elite origins. He has big ideas about how to revolutionize things, and if Uncle Aldo isn't ready to act, maybe there are ways around him. Maurizio already has 50% of the board's votes. To get a majority, he just needs one of his cousins to team up with him. He considers his options. Giorgio? Too timid. Roberto? Too obedient. And then there's Paolo. Who his dad told him to steer clear of, right? Right. But Rodolfo's not around anymore to tell Maurizio what to do. And he's done taking orders. He's free to make his own decisions. Free to do whatever he wants. He strikes a deal with Paolo. And we already know how the story goes from there. They send their people. Yeah, because they're people who have people. Yeah, something I totally aspire to. Same. The reps go to the boardroom and show the Roy family how it's done. In just one meeting, Maurizio takes over one of the biggest fashion labels in the world. He's going to make sure nobody stands in his way. And I mean nobody. Maurizio's first act as chairman is to fire anyone at the company who he deems isn't loyal to him. So basically anyone who doesn't agree with his vision to streamline Gucci. The so-called dissenters have got to go. So same philosophy as our game nights. Yeah, exactly. But he'd prefer to not do it himself. He makes his father's old secretary can them, and then he turns around and fires her. Mm, what a little bitch. Yeah, seriously. I mean, he should have at least gotten Patrizia to fire everyone. She would have loved it. But Maurizio didn't even tell her what he was planning. In fact, she barely sees him anymore. Every lunch is a scheduled business meeting. He's traveling all the time, working 15-hour days. She tries to use their dinners to make up for lost time, to offer advice and talk strategy. But he doesn't engage. The more she wants to talk business, the more silent he becomes. Finally, Patrizia hits her breaking point. She can't take it anymore. She snaps, Who the hell do you think you are ignoring me like this? I'm still your chief advisor. Maurizio looks up at her with a fury she's never seen before and says, First I had my father who told me what to do, and then I had you. I'm done taking orders. And then he fires her too. Patrizia can't believe it. Rodolfo is right after all. Power has changed Maurizio. Now that he's in charge, he doesn't want her help. He resents her for even offering it. But deep down, Patrizia doesn't know if Maurizio can run Gucci without her. He's never been good at making decisions by himself. Sooner or later, he'll have to admit that or risk losing everything they've worked for. In 1986, Maurizio makes one of his first bold moves as chairman. He makes Gucci an official sponsor at America's Cup. Mm, these rich people in their yachts. Seriously, and that's exactly what Maurizio's thinking. This is the biggest sailing competition in the world. It attracts the wealthiest of the wealthy. Exactly the type of people who buy Gucci. Maurizio sinks millions into building the perfect boat and hiring the best of the best for the crew. Everyone else at Gucci thinks it's a waste of time and money. But Maurizio has a gut feeling about this. He enlists Gucci's staff to design the crew's uniforms and tells them to spare no expense. By the time he's done, the bill has climbed past $20 million. Mm. His uncle and cousins are appalled, but Maurizio doesn't care. When people think back on this America's Cup, they'll remember just one word. Gucci. And Maurizio ends up being right. Kind of. When the Gucci-sponsored boat arrives in Australia where the race is being held, it's heavier than expected. The crane that's lifting it topples over and crashes into the boat. Everyone watches in horror as the injured yacht turns belly up and sinks into the Indian Ocean. The mishap becomes a tragic and embarrassing headline. But when Patrizia hears about the accident, 
her first feeling is hope. If ever Maurizio needed a sign that he should bring her back into his inner circle, this is it. She sits by the phone and waits for his call. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that call is not coming. No, it's not. Patrizia begins to accept that this might be her new normal. Their relationship isn't going back to what it was. But maybe she can adjust. She can't be his advisor, but she can still be his wife, at least when he's around. More and more weekends are becoming business trips. He packs a bag, kisses their girls goodbye, and sometimes kisses her too. But then, one day in May, right after Maurizio has left on yet another trip, his doctor shows up at their door. Patrizia's confused. Obviously, Maurizio isn't here right now. The doctor steps inside. He's not here for Maurizio. He's here to see her. He has a message from her husband. He's not coming home. This weekend or ever. Gives new meaning to the term house call. Yeah, this guy is really good at confrontation by messenger. He overthrows his uncle with a rep, he gets his secretary to fire people, and then he gets his doctor to tell his wife it's over. Patrizia yells at the doctor, where is he and why the hell did he send you? The doctor gives her an apologetic little smile and says, maybe because I could give you this? He offers a bottle of Valium from his bag. Okay. <laughs> Patrizia pushes the doctor and his bottle out the door. She's absolutely furious. If this is what Maurizio wants, he's going to have to tell her that himself. It's a couple more months before Maurizio finally calls. You mean he didn't ask his mailman to make the call? Shockingly, no. He's back in Milan and he finally wants to talk. Patrizia is nervous. This is what she wanted, to talk in person. But what if he tells her he wants a divorce? Then you say yes, easiest decision ever. I agree, but Patrizia isn't ready for that. She's pissed, but honestly, she still loves him. She agrees to meet and asks where. When he suggests Santa Lucia, the trattoria where they went on their first date, she starts to feel a little more hopeful. He wouldn't have picked their restaurant to end things. And she's sort of right. When Patrizia arrives for dinner, Maurizio immediately lays it all out. He doesn't want to file for divorce. He wants to separate and pretend to the world that they're still together. They won't even tell their daughters the truth. So it's not completely over. Patrizia lets out a long breath. He still needs her in his life. He needs her to be his plus one. Patrizia nods and says she'll do it. Maybe her old Maurizio is still in there and this is just a midlife crisis. She just needs to wait it out. She can play the long game and maybe, just maybe, win her husband back. It's Christmas morning in St. Moritz. Patrizia, Maurizio, and their daughters, Alessandra and Allegra, sit by an enormous Christmas tree. Presents are piled high and the whole chalet looks like a winter wonderland. Patrizia has gone all out this year. For the past few months, she and Maurizio have been going on pseudo dates to galas and charity events to keep up the facade of a happy couple. But they have been getting along and enjoying each other's company. So she's certain he agreed to this family vacation because it's time to reconcile. Patrizia excitedly hands Maurizio the present she bought for him. She spent endless hours picking out the perfect gift. She watches as Maurizio opens the small box and pulls out diamond and sapphire encrusted cufflinks. But Maurizio doesn't smile. He looks at them, says thank you, and puts them right back in the box. Wow, rude. Yeah, but then he hands her the present he got her. Her manicured nails tear through the wrapping paper. She hears the signature clink clink of something metal inside. Could it be a bracelet, a necklace? She opens it and pulls out a keychain from America's Cup. Oof, my ex must have gone to the Maurizio School of Gift Giving. That's <laughs> awful. Yeah, Patrizia is pissed. Later that night, Maurizio bails on a party they were supposed to go to together, and it's the last straw. When Patrizia comes back to the chalet, she doesn't hold back. She tells him he should have been there and that his gift was insulting. She's gone above and beyond busting her ass to make this holiday memorable, to make it special for him. 
But to her shock, he doesn't care that he's hurt her feelings. Instead, he grows furious. He grabs her by the neck and lifts her off the ground. Oh, hell no. As he holds her up, he shouts, This way you'll grow tall. Patrizia gathers her will and wheezes back at him. Keep going. I could use a few extra inches. The whole time their daughters are watching, huddled in a doorway, terrified. When Maurizio sees them, he lets her go. Then he packs his suitcase and leaves. And this time, he makes it clear it's for good. That evening, Patrizia writes in her diary that their marriage is finally over. She later adds... Only a real jerk would dump his wife at Christmas. Sincerely yours, Cindy Lou Who. The divorce papers arrive soon after that. For the next few months, Patrizia can barely muster the strength to get out of bed. She's depressed, sometimes even suicidal. The life she thought she had is gone. The only time she feels remotely like herself is when she's spending time with her best friend, Pina, who's a professional psychic. Patrizia calls her at all hours, and Pina's always there to talk or read her fortune, whatever she needs. With her friend's help, Patrizia slowly puts herself back together. But just as she's starting to feel better, she begins to get headaches, and not the kind that a couple Advil will fix. She hides away in her bedroom during the day with the lights off. She's in excruciating pain. Finally, she goes to see the doctor, and they find a brain tumor the size of a billiard ball. If she has any chance of surviving, she needs surgery stat. Patrizia's terrified. She's only 44 years old, and her daughters are only 15 and 11. If something happens to her, who's going to take care of them? She starts to think about the state of her relationship with Maurizio. Sure, he's a dickhead who tried to dump her with a doctor's note, but he's still their daughter's father. If anything goes wrong with this operation, she needs to know he'll be there for them. So she tells Maurizio to come to the hospital for the surgery, keep the girls company, hold their hands, and try, just for this one awful moment, to be a family. Patrizia lies in a hospital bed her head's shaved and wrapped in bandages. She starts to wake up as she hears the nurse's voice. The surgery was a success. The doctor removed the tumor, and it was benign. Patrizia sighs in relief. Her recovery will be long and taxing, but she'll live. Her eyes begin to focus. She sees her mother, Silvana, who takes her hand and holds it tight. Patrizia sees her daughters, They carefully hug her. She looks around and asks, where's Maurizio? Silvana shakes her head. He's not coming. He says he's too busy. Later, orchids arrive with a note that simply says, Maurizio Gucci. No condolences, just his name. Patrizia hurls the flowers across the room. She's no longer heartbroken. She's furious. She's disgusted by the man she thought she knew and once loved. The man she gave her best years to. And now that she's been granted a second chance at life, she's not going to play nice. She's going to make him pay for everything he's taken from her. It's 1987, and Patrizia isn't the only Gucci with a thirst for revenge. Remember Paolo, the cousin who teamed up with Maurizio? Yeah, of course. Well, Maurizio got Paolo to his side by making promises. Promises like, of course you'll be vice president, and we'd love to make your new handbag ideas a reality. What Paolo always wanted was to be listened to and taken seriously. And Maurizio promised that would finally happen. Jump ahead a few months, and Maurizio names Paolo's brother Giorgio as VP instead. It's a new regime, but Paolo's just as overlooked as before. 
He isn't going to just roll over and take it, though. To start, he channels his rage into lawsuits against his father. The first dozen or so go nowhere. But that doesn't dissuade Paolo. In 1984, he files documents with the court showing Aldo has been cheating his taxes and owes the U.S. over $7 million in income tax. The IRS takes notice, and a grand jury investigation follows. On September 11th, 1986, Aldo Gucci is sent to prison. Now, Paolo is as shocked as anyone that his dad serves actual time, and for tax evasion no less. In 1980s Italy, it's a point of pride among the rich to not pay their taxes. Pretty sure that's not just unique to Italy. That's fair. But Paolo is taking notes. Maybe he's finally found his family's Achilles heel. And he knows exactly who he's going to take down next. It's June 1987 at the office of Maurizio's lawyer. They're at an antique conference table going down a checklist of ordinary business when Maurizio's driver Luigi bursts into the room. His face is bright red. Sweat drips from his mustache. He's been running all over the city looking for Maurizio. The Guardia di Finanza, Italy's financial police, is on their way to arrest him right now. Maurizio jumps to his feet. Is this for real? Luigi assures him it is. Paolo tipped the authorities off about Maurizio's own tax evasion, in this case, skirting inheritance taxes. Maurizio has to get out of the country within the next hour. He races home. He throws what he can into a bag and drives as fast as he can to Switzerland. If he wants to avoid charges, he'll have to stay for at least a year. He spends his first few months in Switzerland angry, frustrated, and overwhelmed. It feels like everyone's against him. Gee, I wonder why. (laughs) Yeah, his soon-to-be ex-wife, his cousins, and now the police. It's too much. But then in 1990, he meets someone who makes him feel a little less alone. Actually, he's met her before. They knew each other as teenagers back when their mega-rich families vacationed on the beaches of Santa Margarita. Her name is Paola Franchi. And unlike Patrizia, Paula is low maintenance and chill. Okay, but to be fair, it sounds like everyone is chill compared to Patrizia. That is fair. On their very first date, Maurizio feels like he's known her forever, or never stopped knowing her. They talk through the night, and he basically gives her his full autobiography. His terrible childhood, all the family feuds, the recent scandals. And Paula listens, like really listens. Finally, Maurizio has someone who's in his corner, and he's going to need all the support he can get for what comes next. Throughout all of this, Maurizio stays committed to his strategy of making Gucci the ultimate rich person's brand. But projecting an aura of money requires money. Back in Italy, Maurizio builds new company headquarters that cost $6 million a year. He also dips into Gucci's coffers to rent his own $100,000 per year penthouse and to buy the art and antiques collection that his new penthouse requires. Oh, and Ferraris. Every penthouse requires at least two Ferraris. Requires? They're not smoke detectors. (laughs) To rich people, they are. But Maurizio never bothered to check Gucci's account balance. Mm. He just assumed with Gucci's size and success that money wouldn't be a problem. But he forgot to factor in the millions Gucci was still paying for all the intra-family lawsuits. In the U.S. alone, 15 new lawsuits were filed in a five-year period. So Gucci is hemorrhaging money, which means Maurizio needs to find a fresh cash infusion. He turns to an Anglo-Arab investment bank, InvestCorp. And with their help, he addresses the real problem. His incredibly bad business instincts? (laughs) No, his family. Between 1987 and 1989, Maurizio feeds InvestCorp personal information about his uncle and cousins. They combine Maurizio's intel with their own capital to buy out Paolo, Roberto, Giorgio, and finally, Aldo. But once on board, InvestCorp quickly discovers that Maurizio had driven Gucci $40 million into debt. So in 1990, InvestCorp asks Maurizio, the last Gucci standing, to step aside. 
They don't want his shares. He can keep those. But they want to bring on a new CEO to help run things. I mean, honestly, that sounds more than fair. Yeah. Maurizio still manages to be bitterly insulted. Help him run Gucci? He is Gucci. He proclaims that he's going to buy InvestCorp out or leave. They clearly can't coexist. But Maurizio has driven himself into as much debt as the company by now. There's no way he can buy out InvestCorp. But despite his declaration, he doesn't step down either. Instead, Maurizio tries to convince InvestCorp to put in more money. That could fix all their problems. Shockingly, they don't agree. (laughs) Maurizio gets desperate. He starts borrowing money from friends and even employees to keep Gucci going. Mm, Always a good sign when your boss borrows money from you. (laughs) Truly. Patrizia, who's watching all of this from afar, decides it's time to intervene. You'd think she would have given up on talking sense into him, but this is something else. He's squandering their daughter's inheritance on top of ruining everything she worked for. So Patrizia goes to Maurizio. She gives it to him straight. He's failing and badly. The best thing he can do is stay on as honorary chairman. But for the sake of everyone, let someone else run the day-to-day. I think I know how this conversation's gonna go. Wow, you're really giving Pina the psychic a run for her money. (laughs) Maurizio refuses to hear any of it. He hisses at her. Do you know why our marriage failed? Because you fancied yourself the president. And here, there's only one president. In early 1993, Maurizio's creditors all come calling. In his gambit to keep himself and his company afloat, he leveraged everything, including his properties and his 50% stake in Gucci. He has nothing left to pay the loans back. There's only one choice. Maurizio sells his stake in Gucci. His partner turned adversary InvestCorp buys him out and becomes the sole owner. Gucci is now fully out of family control. Maurizio's cousins hate him for this, even more than for pushing them out of the business. Gucci with no Gucci's? It's a disgrace, an embarrassment, unforgivable. But the president of the Maurizio Hate Club is still Patrizia. Gucci was her life's work too. And as their divorce moves through the courts, rumors are swirling that he plans to marry Paola the moment their divorce is finalized. After all these years, Patrizia can't go back to the B-team. She remembers how it felt, walking past her father's huge house as a kid and knowing they didn't live there because her mother was just a mistress. She refuses to go back to those days. Maurizio can't make her. Wild thoughts race through her head, like, what would happen if Maurizio died? Then she and her daughters would inherit his money instead of Paola. What's left of it anyway? She begins joking with strangers about all the ways her ex could die. Okay, that would be super awkward. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, at her daughter's birthday party, she even sidles up to a lawyer and asks super casual, what would happen if I got rid of that ex-husband of mine, legally speaking? Obviously, she's just joking, but she also, like, really, really loves that joke. The more she hears about him and Paula, the more obsessive her hatred becomes. She writes hundreds of pages in her diary detailing her rage. She leaves nasty messages on Maurizio's answering machine. And then, just in case he deletes them without listening, she tapes more nasty messages and gets them hand-delivered. Ooh, that's a fun new hobby. What makes it so much worse for Patrizia is that as she spirals, Maurizio seems to be on the upswing. It looks like he might emerge from all of his horrible decisions unscathed. He's going to marry Paula. He's cooking up a new business idea for a casino in Switzerland. He's ready for a fresh start. But then, on March 27th, 1995, a man in an expensive coat follows Maurizio into work. The era of Maurizio, as Patrizia once put it, is over. At only 46 years old, Maurizio dies on the scene. The police begin a sweeping investigation, but they have an unusual problem for a murder case. Too many suspects. Nearly everyone in Maurizio's orbit had a motive to kill him. 
The investigation goes in circles. The evidence at the scene doesn't add up. Family members refuse to cooperate with them. Every clue leads to a dead end. They're gonna need a miracle to find the killer. Or maybe just a psychic. This is episode two of our three-part series, Murder in the House of Gucci. We use many sources when researching our stories, including Vanity Fair, The Guardian, People Magazine, and The House of Gucci by Sarah Gay Forden. I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. Jojo Wright wrote this episode. Our editor is Allison Reimer. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Sound design by Sam Ada. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our senior producers are Natalie Shisha and Ben Gray. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marsha Louie. For Wondery. <laughs>